Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, ICANN 71 Insights from the Virtual Meeting. My name is Tariq Hopkins, and I'll be your moderator. Joining us today is Gretchen Olive. Gretchen is the Director of Policy and Global Domain Name Services for CSC. For nearly two decades, Gretchen has helped Global 2000 companies devise global domain name, trademark, and online brand protection strategies, and is the leading authority on ICANN's new GTLD program. And with that, let's welcome Gretchen. So hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I um, really appreciate you taking the time. As usual, we have a pretty packed agenda. Um, always an ICANN meeting is never, uh, never, never a time for, you know, rest. It's always go, 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 go. And these virtual ones have been no, no different, quite honestly. It's actually almost a little bit more hectic because you're trying to cover, cover so much um, virtually. So anyway, um, so today's agenda, we're going to obviously cover our ICANN overview. I always like to make sure that everybody kind of understands who we're talking about. I do still see some new names on our registration list, so I'm excited um, that you've been able to join us, and I want to make sure kind of level set everybody. Then we'll jump into regulatory developments and its impact on ICANN. Some interesting stuff going on there. We'll talk about DNS abuse continues to be a hot topic um, and a really important topic. Um, we'll also go through the ICANN policy development process updates, um, give you the, the latest on where the EPDP stands, the rights protection mechanism PDP stands, the subsequent procedures PDP stands, as well as the transfers PDP. That's a new PDP that's just recently gotten underway. Then we'll kind of cover things off by talking about the GAC and kind of what their thoughts and concerns are, are this meeting, along with my usual predictions um, around like what's going on with the new GTLD round two. I get asked that question. It's like every week still, you know, when is that going to happen? Is that going to happen? So we'll cover kind of some developments around that and uh, my latest prediction, if you will, for new GTLD round two. So for the newer people who are joining us, just to kind of um, make sure you kind of understand how these ICANN meetings are kind of um, structured, ICANN has three public meetings a year, and you know they call them meeting A, meeting B, meeting C. <laughs> um, they kind of happen about the same time each year, you know, time frame each year. Um, we're in the meeting B cycle, which is a policy forum. It's typically a shorter meeting, four days. Um, and it really is focused on policy work and kind of community interaction. There isn't a lot of like the extra things that happen at an ICANN meeting, you know, things like, um, you know, different presentations on high interest topics or, you know, a lot of kind of ICANN um, kind of extra, you know, uh, kind of showcasing of, of what they've been doing. This is really kind of like roll up your sleeves work, community, kind of like, you know, getting into the trenches with each other um, to work through different working groups and um, PDPs, policy development processes. So always a busy meeting. Now, in terms of kind of ICANN, ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Um, they're the organization that governs the Internet, um, particularly when it comes to kind of the naming and addressing system. They're not responsible for content, and we'll talk about, you know, Internet content and kind of policing that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, it's, a, it's kind of a really interesting organization. It has a board of directors. It, you know, has an ombudsman. It has a staff president and a staff. But largely, um, ICANN is made up of different, you know, stakeholder organizations that are made up of volunteers from different kind of areas of the community. And so you'll see here, you know, there's kind of two rows of blue boxes and then kind of a row of gray boxes. We tend to spend most of our time talking about kind of the big blue box in the middle, which is the GNSO, the Generic Name Supporting Organization. And this is where a lot of really important policy work and these stakeholder kind of groups, where some really important kind of bottom-up consensus policy work get started. And then it kind of bubbles up through to the, the, the different, like, you know, GNSO in this case, the Generic Name Supporting Organization, kind of to that council. And then 
once it gets through there, it will go up to the board for consideration. So, you know, it's, the GNSO is where we spend a lot of our time and focus because that's where the contracted parties, the registrars and the registries, as well as like the intellectual property group and the business constituencies and other kind of important um, stakeholders in, in the internet for commercial purposes um, kind of really sit. There's also these gray boxes you'll see, and we'll mention a few of them here today um, during our, our kind of session. Um, we'll definitely talk about the really darkest gray box, which is the Governmental Advisory um, Committee, often referred to as the GAC, as well as the Security and Stability Advisory Committee. These kind of organizations in the or groups in the gray, they are, are advisory. They advise the board, and they typically you know, kind of come at things from a more kind of public policy, technical expertise kind of viewpoint. They don't necessarily get in the weeds, um, although some of them are getting more and more involved in sort of like the early stages of the policy development, but they definitely are looking at things as they're coming up for board consideration and letting the ICANN board know kind of what they think is missing, what's good, um, what could be potentially tweaked, things like that. So, it, you know, it's, like I said, made up of all these volunteers that come from really all over the globe. Um, and this past ICANN meeting, even though it was virtual, had over 1,500 participants, you know, something like 150 different countries represented. So it's a pretty diverse group, not only from ge geographically and kind of from a cultural perspective, but also from kind of an agenda perspective. So it, uh, consensus is hard fought um, in the ICANN world. All right, so with that foundation set, I want to first kind of talk about um, a bunch of regulatory developments and kind of what it's, what's kind of happening is that it relates to ICANN. It, it, you know, I, I think when the the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, came on the scene in like 2016, 2017. Uh, it really caught a lot of people in the community, quite honestly, by surprise, if, that, if that's possible with <laughs> something uh, as uh, important as that. But, you know, while the kind of in the EU, they were you know, working and talking about the GDPR for quite some time before it got kind of enacted and then, you know, its enforceability became, um, you know, became enforceable in, in May of 2018. It was, you know, like there's all this work going on in the ICANN policy world um, around the who is and accuracy of who is and what information you know, like things around like privacy and proxy, you know, um, registrations and, you know, accessibility and viewability of um, who is information. This is, you know, who is has been an issue in the ICANN world. Oh, goodness. Since I started following this over 20 years ago and, um, you know, when the GDPR, you know, for years, ICANN kind of almost ignored or scoffed at the different national kind of privacy laws that were out there and it's just, you know, as part of their contract, you know, this public display of who, who is information was just required. It was required to be collected by the registrars and provided in most cases directly to the registries and it was to be published and searchable um, in a free and public way. And, you know, it was, you know, when GDPR burst on the, to the scene, it was like, whoa, we actually got to do something about this. And it kind of set ICANN on fire in many ways. And we wound up with sort of a temporary specification, like a temporary policy to give us, give the community more time to work on a more permanent policy for who is. And what's happening again, and I, I think this is just, it's going to quite honestly, I think, get more and more to be the case is that there's a lot of discussion going on, you know, at a national level, at like a, you know, European Commission level um, about many issues in affecting the internet. The fact of the matter is, is the internet is a, is, has become a critical resource to countries from both an economic perspective, from a social perspective, you know, from operational perspective and, you know, 
it is something they are very interested in making sure, you know, there's the proper protections, there's the proper frameworks. And so there's just more and more kind of regulatory activity around the world on this stuff. And so, you know, right now there's some regulatory developments currently what I call percolating, you know, particularly in the EU um, that really have direct impact on the work that's going on at ICANN. Um, the three specifically I'm talking about, and they're often, uh, I've heard them recently called as like the trifecta, but it's the Network and Information Security Directive 2. This is like an update or revision of the initial NS, NIS. Um, so this is NIS 2. Um, the Digital Services Act, or the DSA, and also the Convention on Cyber Crime of the Council of Europe. This is often referred to as the Budapest um, Convention. It's a treaty. And um, they're looking to kind of add to that, um, kind of a, an additional um, kind of part to that. So, you know, these things are very actively being worked on and discussed um, outside of ICANN. And all three of these have potential significant impact on ongoing policy work and existing policy at ICANN. So it really continues to highlight kind of the three problems that ICANN has of like timing. You know, the timing of what this all is like, how do you line this up? Really impossible, quite honestly. Representation is ICANN, can ICANN represent, you know, all in the community? Probably not. Who should represent? Do the different con, you know constituencies or, or working groups, as they're called these days, are they you know all equally prepared to meaningfully participate in these discussions and represent the kind of groups that that they um, kind of represent in the ICANN community? It's a real challenge right now, and we'll go through some of these um, to kind of illustrate this challenge and to kind of be aware of these things going on around ICANN because it's becoming abundantly clear that just following ICANN is not enough anymore, like following what they were doing in terms of policy. You got to kind of follow the policies across um, <laughs> across the, the, you know, the globe in addition to ICANN to kind of understand the rules of the road that are going to be in effect on the internet. So it's definitely an interesting time. So let's dive into these kind of three regulatory things that are going on around kind of ICANN. So first one is the Network and Information Security, Security Directive 2, referred to as um, NIS 2. So the ori original NIS directive was enacted in 2016. And while I think a lot of people would definitely agree that this was, um, you know, the initial directive was successful. It really raised cybersecurity kind of to, um, you know, every, everybody, not only just their attention, but like put some um, some basic rules around, you know, how providers could ensure um, critical infrastructure and sort of have appropriate security measures in place to, to manage cyber risk. But, it, you know, it was early days um, still, um, you know, it's hard to believe here in 2021, you know, like five years ago, it's not that long ago, but in, in the kind of the internet world, it's like an eternity. So, you know, it needs to be updated. It has to address kind of like the varying interpretations that happened across the EU, much like kind of privacy rules. You know, there was initially this kind of myriad of privacy rules at the different, you know, national level in the EU. But it was hard to harmonize all those, and it's sort of the same here with the cybersecurity um, directive, in that you know different countries kind of interpreted things different way and implemented them different ways. So there's a lot, a lot of sort of like nuance between what jurisdiction you're in. So kind of need to kind of bring that a little bit more together to harmonize it, and also that just the digital transformation that has occurred since the initial you know, enactment, you know, add to that sort of what COVID did to all of us. Like we all had to learn how to do everything remotely, online, you know, and that that really, you know, expanded the threat landscape. It created so many new challenges faced by governments, consumers, businesses. So there's just 
catch up that catch up work that needs to be done um that this NS, NIS2 will will uh, hopefully you know work to address um the NIS2 proposal I provide you a hyperlink when you when you get the slides you can click that link and it will take you to a, a, a nice page that the European Commission has will give you lots of good information around what the proposal, you know, is and, and kind of some some key points. But they, the European Commission adopted it in December of 2020. Now, don't get nervous. It doesn't mean that, like, tomorrow it's, you know, in, in effect. Um, but it, it does aim to kind of be far, you know, broader reaching as well as more comprehensive. And, you know, some of the changes it's looking to bring is kind of the application of new sectors to this kind of critical role. So there's a lot of like, I would say new and expanded definitions, um, so stronger security requirements, more secure supply chain relationships, um, supervisory me me measures and sanctions, information sharing and cooperation, as well as vulnerability disclosures. So um, there's a lot packed into this. Um, again, it's, it's the European Commission has now adopted it, but there's a lot of other work that has to happen before it actually gets enacted. So don't panic quite yet, but important to be aware of it. So there are two areas where NIS2 and kind of ICANN policy contracts and, and just kind of activities in the, in the ICANN community kind of cross paths here. Um, one is the ac applicability of NIS2 requirements for what's called essential entities. It's a defined term. Um, and it includes DNS service providers. That's pretty big. That puts, you know, the contracted parties at ICANN, registries, registrars, in, um, you know, in scope of this, of this regulation. In addition, the proposed requirements concerning um, domain registration, that's in Article um, 23, you know, this has been, you know, kind of like all the focus between DNS abuse and who is, um, this has been really the focus of like every um, ICANN meeting over the last two years. You know, we, we when the GDPR was, in, um, was enforceable starting in May of 2020, you know, we all saw that who is so relatively dark, um, at least the bad guys, we no longer, you know, had to worry about their information um, being, pu you know, published. And, you know, it's, it's definitely, you know, these are, these are, you know, existing contracts and policy work. So this kind of new wrinkle out, outside of ICANN really starts this kind of like chicken and egg discussion of, you know, should ICANN sit around and wait for this to all sort of the NIS2 to sort out before it does, you know, finishes up its policy work? Or, you know, should they just go forward and then once this comes out, they might have to kind of do a redo. So, you know, the timeline, when I mentioned on the prior slide, like don't panic, it's not, you know, in effect right now, NIS2 is not in effect now, is, you know, this this proposal was um, a, a, approved by the European Commission. Now it's subject to negotiations between what they call co-legislators um, to come to a final draft. So. You know, they'll be working with the different national governments, et cetera, to kind of come to um, final draft. But once it's agreed and adopted, member states will have about 18 months to ch kind of convert it into their local law, transpose it into their local law. So this is, you know, tricky, very tricky because, um, you know, we, we could sit around and delay, but, uh, you know, the Internet doesn't turn off. So, you know, what do you do? So if you want to, um, I, I supply here a link um, to the comments that I can submitted um, regarding this. And quite honestly, you know, the impact on the who is EPDP, you know, all three phases, you know, that is, you know, there's a big question mark. You know, how does this get completed? How does it get implemented with this kind of happening in the background? We're gonna we're gonna find out, I guess. And then we have the Digital Services Act. Um, the DSA is basically, in response to the growing concern over the role and kind of responsibility of online platforms, um, I know here in North America, um, there's not really a day that goes by on the news that we're not talking about 
you know, the different online platforms and, you know, what, you know, who's going to, you know, onto Capitol Hill to, to testify or to be questioned or there's just a lot going on about, like, you know, do you, how do you regulate this? Do you regulate um, kind of online platforms? How, you know, what, um, you know, the, the influence that they have is, is pretty um, immense. And so there just is this constant kind of feeling like there needs to be some guardrails. And so this DSA will introduce obligations concerning illegal content that will apply to digital services providers that offer services in Europe, um, regardless, though, of whether they are established in Europe. And so a lot of, the, you know, the Internet services and platforms, they they don't know borders. They're they're not just contained into a particular country. So um, you know they're very extraterritorial. You know these these laws have to be extraterritorial and, and to kind of be able to do what they're intended to do. Um, the proposal also attempts to clarify the rules for kind of conditional exemption from liability. Um, Domain name service, um, domain name system service providers are in scope. So this is, this is going to be interesting also. You know, they're trying to better protect consumers and their fund fundamental rights online. They're trying, trying to establish kind of more transparency and accountability and kind of foster that innovation and growth and competitiveness that the internet provides. But it's going to be, um, it's interesting because I can, you know, they're, if they're not, they always, you know, kind of remind everybody they're not content police. So um, how this is going to sort out is a little unclear. How, what kind of, like, how I can going to deal with this is a little bit unclear. So in light of the fact that I can is kind of long held that, you know, they're not the content police. That's not within their remit. They are really just the technical coordinator of the identifier system. Um, the challenge is, is that, you know, like it or not, <laughs> there's, there's, um, you know, ICANN is is in the DNA, is part of the fabric of the DNS. And so the current version of the DSA really, one of the challenges is, you know, in, in ICANN's eyes is that it lacks clarity regarding exactly which DNS services are targeted and whether they would fall under the general scope of the um, application of the DSA. So, it's really, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, definitions, new definitions, you know, talking about three intermediary service categories. Um, you know, there's there's more that needs to be fleshed out there. There's also concerns around, like I said, the liability exemption for third-party content when it comes to DNS services. So, you know, what impact does that have on ICANN, ICANN's scope, ICANN's contracts and compliance? It's very unknown right now, but there's a clear sense that, there's a train coming down the track, and that it's a train that they need to keep close eye on. So again, um, I can submit comments. I provide you a link there where you can view what they sent, and um, you know this will be something we'll continue to 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 watch. And then there's a third of the trifecta, which is the Convention on Cybercrime. Um, this is often referred to as the Budapest Convention. So um, it's it's the only Binding international instrument um, on this issue of, of cybercrime. It was open for signature in, in 2001. Um, you know, 20 years later, it's got 65 states that have become parties and kind of 12 that have, further 12 that have signed it or been invited to. Um, the challenge here is like when cybercrime, you know, what, the, what this thing tries to deal with is when, you know, cybercrime and kind of other online offenses happen, it, there's electronic evidence and it's on computer systems that are, you know, they're in foreign, multiple, shifting, unknown jurisdictions, the cloud. Um, it is really hard for law enforcement to get to it. And it's really, you know, the, you know, much of the law is very, ter you know, it's territorial. It's hard when these kind of cross-border things happen. And, you know, cybercrime is like the biggest example of, of the challenges where, you know, 
bad guys do bad things and they have data and systems everywhere and getting access to that and getting that evidence is is really 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 difficult so they've drafted this what they call the second additional protocol to the convention um there was another um protocol uh, kind of another additional protocol r related to um you know, like discrimination, things like that. So this this is very different, and it really seeks to provide the second additional protocol, seeks to really look to establish like direct cooperation with service providers um, around domain name registration services, um, other parties for disclosure of information, um, expedited forms of cooperation, um, expedited cooperation disclosure in emergency situations, additional tools for kind of mutual assistance, as well as data protection um, and other rule of law safeguards. So it's 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 you know really trying to get to enable um, better you know ability to kind of cross border um, collect evidence and and kind of get justice in these um, cybercrime situations. So this whole piece around um, kind of the additional requirements regarding domain name registration information was added to this um, second you know, protocol in November 2020 and actually confirmed in April 2021. It's, it's found in Article 6. And you know, this set off all kinds of bells and whistles that I can because it is right, right at the heart of a lot of the um, EPDP stuff. And so, you know, they've made the Council of Europe aware of the ongoing work um, that's going on within the ICANN community, and they've kind of pledged their their participation in any kind of consultations or online meetings that um, the Council of Europe is, is going to do around this. But you know, I, this is a kind of the second of the trifecta that's really got, you know, very clear potential impact on that who is the PDP um, completion and implementation. So, you know, again, all this stuff going on, there's, you know, outside of ICANN is really compli further complicating the work being done within ICANN. But if you want to um, see the comments that ICANN has submitted thus far, you can check that link out um, for, for more information. Gretchen, uh, great presentation so far. It looks like we actually had a question come in um, from Elise, and she's asking, it seems like there's a lot of policy work happening outside of ICANN related to things ICANN normally governs. Are we getting to a point where maybe ICANN is not really needed anymore? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, you know, I, 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 look, I, I definitely think that ICANN still has a, <laughs> still has a role to play. There's a lot of you know, kind of very um, in the weeds things, like we're talking about like the transfers and, and things like that. There's some very in the weeds things that still um, need to be discussed. And quite honestly, you know, ICANN is responsible for like, you know, putting new TLDs and taking TLDs off the root system. So, you know, there's still work to be done by ICANN, but um, they are not the only game in town on policy anymore. It used to be kind of their kind of Almost exclusive purview, but um, it's going to be interesting. They're going to have to. They're going to have to change. It's going to. It's going to be interesting. I, I don't know that we're at that change point yet, but um, I don't see it too far down the track. So, really, really good question, Elise. Thanks for that. All right. So let's. Um, you know, one of the one of the reasons I you know wanted to go through those kind of policy things that are going on around ICANN, in addition, you know, like to, and how that's kind of impacting policy work, is that, you know, there's I mentioned earlier, there's kind of like two big topics that continue to, to take all the air um, in, in the room at, at ICANN, and you know, one of it is one 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 of it is um, who is the other one is DNS abuse. Um, you know, the DNS is being abused. It's a chronic and growing problem. Um, it's only magnified by outside events, and, you know, COVID has been, like, example A. Their challenge is, is that it seems like I was reading something the other day, and I couldn't agree more with this author's perspective, is that it seems like everything that bad that happens on the Internet is, like, tossed into the bucket of DNS abuse. But 
when you really look for like a universal definition of DNS abuse, there really isn't one. And really what qualifies as DNS abuse is something I think we really need to all agree on somehow. Um, but it is getting to be quite a big bucket. And look, you know, you don't need to, you know, look further than many of the headlines, but, you know, look, cybercrime is costing the global economy trillions of dollars. Um, it's estimated this year to be six trillion. But, you know, it's just a growing problem and it's growing exponentially. And so this is a big issue in the ICANN world. And it's something that, um, you know, these regulatory developments and this issue and who is are kind of all, you know, intertwined and and it's 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 a hard it's really hard to um, look at any one of them in isolation because you have to kind of have this bigger picture view of it all. So hopefully we're we're helping you you get that. So you know the question I ask myself all the time, and you know, in conversation with colleagues and other people in the industry. You know, we're we're often kind of looking at ourselves and say, like, all right, we all know this is a really big problem, but really, what is being done about this? And so, in the ICANN world, it's really um, it's a patchwork approach. Just to be honest with you, you know, there's a lot of questions about really is this within ICANN's remit? Is this a problem that's too big for just ICANN? You know, what what impact can compliance effectiveness have on this? Are there the right, you know, kind of tools available? Are they the tools they have adequate? You know, what kind of coordination is kind of required? Is it re is it necessary for ICANN to be kind of like mandating that coordination, or should industry players just kind of voluntarily do that? So it's a, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, definitely, most feel like ICANN and the and the contracted parties um, really need to do more to combat DNS abuse. Um, there are some glimmers of hope, some things going on. Um, I would say none of them are a single bullet, a sing, you know, like a silver bullet, but um, there's a joint effort just underway involving the kind of the registrar stakeholder group and the registry stakeholder group um, to create a trusted notifier framework. It's this kind of sense, these kind of almost like cooperation agreements that there's a recognition that there are certain parties that, you know, they're not going to just spam you, that they are, can be trusted and, and um, are kind of proven to be um, reliable notifiers of bad activity and sort of like how do you handle that. There's a lot of those kind of agreements that already exist. Um, there are some registries that, you know, kind of already, um, you know, offer that kind of cooperation. Um, you know, Nominet is one of them. Um, we see donuts on, on on some of them as well. So, you know, it's it's a start, um, but it's likely it's not going to be ICANN mandated. This cooperation is really kind of happening, yes, during ICANN kind of activities and discussions, but it's not really an ICANN mandated thing, and um, it's quite honestly voluntary. Um, the GAC is also. This is a very big issue for the GAC, um, and they actually have within the GAC the Public Safety Working Group, the PSWG, um, and and they've been trying to work with different groups as well. So like they're working with the registry stakeholder group on a framework related to like gene, uh, domain generated algorithms that are associated with botnets and ma malware. So there's these algorithms that you know will just create hundreds of domain names for um, that are associated with botnets and malware, and it just, it is a challenge. Um, and so, you know, they're trying to work with the registry stakeholder group to build a framework on how to kind of better deal with that um, when, when they're discovered. Um, there's also work being done with the messaging malware and mobile anti-abuse work group. Um, they've recently done a survey of cyber investigators and kind of anti-abuse service providers to really get an understanding of how, you know, when ICANN had to implement the temporary specification when the GDPR became enforceable in May of 2020, sorry, 2018, um, that impact was pretty significant um, related to domain name registration data um, 
access and the anti-abuse work and investigations that are done utilizing that data. So they, they did a, um, they've been working together um, looking at the results of the survey, as well as kind of looking at, you know, looking at cooperating and talking with individual national governments to kind of solicit ideas and possible um, purchase. Japan did um, did a presentation at the ICANN meeting, which kind of like set out some some things that they think can be done to kind of improve compliance and improve like mitigate abuse. There's also you know work being done in the CCTLD community. Um, they're looking at new rules that they can potentially impose. Um, it's 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 a lot. Um, like I said, it's 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 a patchwork approach. It's not one silver bullet, but you know, there is work being done. The question is, is that, you know, is it enough? And will it ever be enough? And, you know, what really needs to happen? And, you know, in a lot of ways I can, is, you know, suggesting like they're not the answer that this needs to be kind of through policy, you know, and regulatory work that this is, you know, better cooperation among, you know, different countries and organizations is gonna have to occur. So it um, continues to be a, a, hot, a hot topic and one for which there's not any quick answers. So another thing that is happening around kind of like the DNS abuse issue and, and it's kind of being looked at as um, kind of an important activity is uh, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee um, recently published, it was late January, their, um, it's called the SSR2 report and this report was really looked at as a you know was really being anticipated and and kind of hopeful that it could be a potential roadmap for a path forward for ICANN on how to help mitigate mitigate DNS abuse. Like as I said, ICANN does not believe that they are the kind of like gonna be the ones that come up with all the full solutions. But they feel like this technical advisory group can really help, you know, focus their efforts on things that can have a meaningful impact. So my prior um, ICANN webinar on the, the meeting in March, I kind of went through at a high level kind of the 63 different recommendations. They kind of fall, fall into kind of four, you know, areas and I, I list those here on this slide, but, you know, um, the board is getting ready to do final deliberations on this. They have to complete their work by July 25th under the bylaws. And so they have an SSR2 board caucus group that's kind of assisting them with the substantive analysis of the recommendations. And when a, when a report like this comes from an advisory committee, there's a very formal process within ICANN where the board must either like, you know, outright accept outright it reject or there can be like a you know we accept part reject part um or ask for more information and so like every recommendation needs to be addressed by that can board so um more to come on this it'll be very interesting to see what level of like given the kind of the importance and the urgency around the cns abuse issue it'll be very interesting to see kind of how many of these recommendations they accept, kind of what's going to be required to implement this stuff in the midst of everything else going on in the ICANN world, and then kind of what level of priority that this gets put on. Um, it'll be interesting to watch. So let's move on to some um, policy development process um, updates. First one up is the expedited policy development process, or the EPDP. Um, I think as everybody knows right now, this was, you know, the the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, became enforceable in May of 2018, and it really set the ICANN world <laughs> on its head. Um, a temporary specification needed to be issued to kind of deal with kind of transfer and who is issues. And that is kind of like what set off this EPDP process, which quite honestly is the first expedited policy development process that was initiated in, in ICANN's history. Now, mind you, we're, we're here almost three years later, so I'm not quite sure how expedited it's really been, but nonetheless, the first expedited policy development process. 
So for some of our kind of newer registrants to this web webinar series, you know, here's a bit of the history around the EPDP. I think the key to understand is that like it was broken down into two phases. They have gotten to the final reports on phase one and phase two. Um, but we're still in a bit of a holding pattern. <laughs> so phase one, um, you know, it was expected that their work, the implementation review team's work um, based on the EPDP phase one report, final report, would be done by now. It's moving at a glacial pace. And I think by now on this webinar, you can understand why. A, there's a lot going on. B, there's a lot of outside forces also. Um, and there's also just um, there's a lot of just questions of of um, kind of the subsequent phase phases, um, phase two, and you know what you'll hear about in a second, two A, that um, kind of the answers to those things are would be helpful to phase one implementation. So, so as I you know said in the prior slide. You know, not a ton of progress been done on the implementation of phase one. Phase two is um, also has its challenges. It's just, you know, a lot of the recommendations that came out of that report, there just wasn't a lot of agreement. And, you know, particularly the SAC and the IT and business um, users kind of constituencies or stakeholder groups. Um, had some very significant concerns and, and, you know, the GAC also. So it uh, continues to move very slowly. And since I mentioned the GAC and their concerns, here's just a reminder of their concerns around the EPDP Phase 2 um, final report. And, you know, even though there was a lot of uh, contention, with the initial recommendations, with the, with the recommendations from the EPDP phase two um, final report, there were also on top of sort of all the disagreement, there was also unresolved what they called kind of overarching issues. And this morphed into phase 2A, um, um, uh, just let's call it phase three. I don't know why we're trying to kind of like hide that it's yet another phase, but nonetheless, Really, the issues that were unresolved related to kind of how to differentiate between natural and legal persons um, in terms of the registration data handling. And then also the feasibility of a uniform anonymized um, registrant email. So those issues could not, they couldn't even get a little bit of <laughs> agreement in the phase two. They got kind of bumped into a phase three. Um, the initial report on that, well, I'm going to I'm going to be correct and say phase 2A. So, an initial report on phase 2A has now been published, and um, in the interim, ICANN is also launching um, their new operational design phase process um, prior to ICANN board review and approval of the phase two recommendations, and you know, so there's just a lot going on still with EPDP, not a lot of progress. Um, it's interesting, ICANN did issue just a few days ago, um, like earlier this month, um, they issued an, um, a questionnaire, I guess that's what they're calling it, a questionnaire to get further input on the, um, you know, the access model that they, kind of prescribed or recommended in, in the phase two report. And, you know, many people in the community feel like it is so unworkable, so cost prohibitive. The GAC is really concerned, uh, particularly around the cost um, issues. So I can, in a smart move, I think, you know, issue this questionnaire, get some additional feedback. Because their operational de design phase, which is kind of a new thing they've kind of added to the PDP processes, okay, before they kind of approve everything, they want to understand, like, what it's going to take to implement this, get some real hard data, kind of scope out some cost and work efforts.
before they go and approve it and say it has to be done. So um, there, you know, this is all new. And um, again, you know, just just going to take more time. It's just going to take more time. Not really quite sure how it's going to end, if t to be honest. Gretchen, great presentation so far. Um, and folks, we're coming up on the tail end of this presentation, but we also had another question come in from Larry. Um, and he asked, do you think the SSAD ODP is going to find what has been proposed is not workable or cost effective? If so, what happens? <laughs> oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, first of all, Larry, congratulations. You've mastered um, acronym soup of ICANN. You got all those acronyms great. Um, what does happen? Uh, you know, it, it doesn't start over. I mean, like, I, I think, you know, some people say, like, I start all over again. I, that's, that's not going to happen. But there are a lot of groups um, kind of kind of in the ICANN sphere that have some kind of proposed alternatives. <laughs> that they think could be more cost effective, could work better. Um, I, I, I do think there's a chance, I do think there's a real chance, in fact, that we find that SSAD is not a sad, is, is not the right solution to the problem we have, um, and that one of those other solutions winds up having to be kind of vetted, discussed, and um, then obviously implementation. So it's going to elongate things further. That's what's going to happen. Um, but I, I, it's, I, I don't know that there's um, there's any like clear defined path like what would happen if this all kind of blows up. So um, more to come, I guess is the answer. Um, so but thanks for that question, Larry. Um, all right, let's let's like as Tarek said, we're at the tail end here, and we'll probably go quickly here for this kind of remaining stuff. So, as, as you guys remember, um, you know, we're going to kind of move past the EPDP, and there's you know, kind of two um, PDPs that have kind of wound up, you know, kind of wrapped up, but they're still sort of lingering um, related to round one of the new GTLD program. So it was the rights protection mechanism. And then there's also subsequent procedures. So we'll talk about rights protection mechanisms first. Um, this was another kind of multi-phased PDP um, that happened, and you know we've we've gotten through these both these phases. Well, actually, they haven't gotten through both <laughs> phases. I sorry, I misspoke there a little bit. They've completed phase one. Phase two is about the UDRP, and we'll talk about that in a second. That. I think going through a little bit of a rescoping, but um, we've we've pretty much got to the final report on phase one. And really, what the bottom line of this is is that the rights protection mechanisms that were introduced in round one. So we're talking about things like trademark clearinghouse and um, you know the, the the different dispute resolution processes, etc. Um, those things um, essentially are going to Stay the same. I mean, really um, small tweaks, but it will be pretty much the status quo will be preserved for for round two. So I think it was by and large felt like the the new rights protection mechanisms were a positive, um, had a positive impact. They weren't perfect, um, and I, I think you know some of the tweaks can marginally improve them, but nonetheless, um, you know we're you know phase one is done, there'll be incremental changes, but, you know, this still has to go through implementation work. So let's move on to um, new GTLD subsequent procedures PDP. Like I said, the second of the PDPs for the kind of related to the first round of the new GTLD program. So this one was focused on kind of the policy, the policies, really the the applicant guidebook that kind of really um, defined how everything from you know eligibility to apply the whole application and review process to like delegation and contract that applicant guide book um, these new GTLD subsequent procedures PDP really was meant to address you know all that was in there 
And it had lots of kind of separate topics, work track, um, but really, you know, is a pretty comprehensive kind of, you know, review of of kind of how the 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 new GTLD program round one unfolded. So like the RPM um, PDP, we're we're kind of pretty close to the end of the line here. Um, we haven't quite crossed it yet, but we're just there. Um, in February of this year, the Generic Name Supporting Organization Council, the GNSO Council, approved the final report. So now it goes to the ICANN board. Um, as kind of was mentioned earlier, like the board has six months to review and approve. Um, there is still some uncertainty around a few um, a few key issues, closed generics, um, mandatory and vol voluntary personal interest commitments or PICs, and kind of how the proposed standing predictability implementation review team and how um, GAC inputs happen in relation to the kind of emerging new GTLD application um, issues. It's just, um, there's there's still work here, um, but it is, you know, it's, it's pretty far down the road but still some things to work through. Um, there is a, a major victory for brand owners and kind of all this work that was done around subsequent procedures. Um, there's a new mandatory personal interest commitment where registry operators cannot get, engage in fraudulent or deceptive practices. There were a few TLDs that had um, some pretty squirrely things happen as part of their, um, you know, after they rolled out things, kind of policies and ways they manage things that um, really did not sit well with um, a lot of people. So anyway, there's there's some, some good things there around personal interest commitments, um, and we'll, we'll see how that kind of shakes out. But some more work to do here, but um, getting, getting super close. So last on our PDP tour is the new transfer PDP. Um, this is another multi-phase PDP. Um, it was launched in February of this year. Um, it's really looking to review the policies around transfer domain names from one registrar to another, especially in light of kind of the loss of who is data um, and the GDPR and some of the things that are expected to be, the kind of fields that are expected to be removed as a result of the work done in the EPDP phase one, like some of those who is fields are going to change or be removed. So um, it's still early days on this PDP, but um, they've kind of broken it out to these phase 1A, 1B, and phase two. 1A um, is where we're gonna really work on work through kind of the form of authorization and authorization code issues that kind of the GDPR has left in its wake. Um, you know, what's been really hard is that losing that email when registrars initiate transfers, um, we're not able to send that form of authorization like we were to the losing registrant. So, um, yeah, it's, it's caused some definite changes and challenges and, and, and quite honestly created some new risks. So. Um, looking forward to this one. I think there's some, some things that can be improved. And uh, phase 1B will be related to change of registrant, which often happens as part of the transfer around the transfer process. And then phase 2, transfer dispute resolution policy and ICANN approval of transfer. So like I said, still very early days, but um, something that's very, you know, it is on our radar, radar and something we'll continue to report out on. Let's just move now to kind of, um, as you're coming down the home stretch here, let's just talk about the GAC. That's the Governmental Advisory Committee. Um, you know, really growing group within ICANN. Again, they're giving advice to the ICANN board. Um, and their membership is increasing pretty rapidly. As I often say <laughs> during an ICANN webinar, is keep your eyes on the GAC. Um, they, like I said, your know, membership is rapidly growing. Um, their power and leverage continues to evolve. Um, they are very diligent and very methodical. 
and they really do a great job in many respects of keeping ICANN and the ICANN community on, on the straight and narrow. Um, the issues of concern that they raise in their, um, they do a communique every ICANN meeting, and this communique they raised, um, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say necessarily raised, but <laughs> raised and reminded is probably the right way to say um, ICANN of some, you know, issues that they continue to be concerned about. So, you know, around subsequent procedures, they're just worried that there's um, a lot of things that are not necessarily uh, fully addressed. Um, that there's still some serious uh, security and stability concerns and um, other issues around safeguards. DNS abuse, they just, they want ICANN to improve contracts, enforcement and reporting. Um, around accuracy of domain name registration data, they just, you know, they will continue to harp that they need to get that right. ICANN needs to do everything it possibly can to make sure who is, whatever who is is out there is accurate. Um, EPDP phase two, ODP, they're really worried about the cost of the implementation of the, the SAD as we've discussed. And they actually are pretty um, pleased that ICANN's kind of issued this questionnaire. So we'll see how that kind of like um, uh, unfolds. There's also the EPDP phase 2A. They're really worried about the voluntary nature of the initial recommendations. Um, that is, is kind of definitely worrying them. That's that sort of phase three I was talking about. The uh, initial report is really um, lays out kind of initial recommendations that are voluntary. So um, they're concerned about that. The CCT review recommendations, for those of you who don't remember what CCT or not ever, have never heard what CCT is, that was like consumer, cho um, consumer um, choice and trust review, I think that's what that ultimately stood for. Stood for. It was a review that was done pretty shortly after the um, the rollout of the new TLD program. It looked at a lot of like overarching issues before they got into the specific PDPs of like the subsequent procedures and the RPMs. It was kind of intended to um, inform those further PDPs, but also raise some sort of overarching issues. And, you know, the GAC really reminds ICANN that they need better tracking as to where those recommendations are in terms of implementation. Um, they also are, you know, continuing to press ICANN that further work is required by them on the CCT review recommendations. It kind of like that report came out, everybody talked about it a meeting or two, and we moved right into these other PDPs. and kind of didn't do too much more on those CCT review recommendations. So they're they're a little concerned about that. So, um, you know, again, keep your eyes on the GAC. So normally in the GAC communique, the, the GAC advice is far longer than what their issues of concern um, are. This time was different. They had one piece of advice. Um, new piece of advice, and I don't even know if it was a really new, but it reminded ICANN that the moratorium on the registration of IGO acronyms, that's inter intergovernmental organization acronyms, should remain in place until the work is completed regarding curative rights protection. So this was whole, the whole Red Cross, Red Crescent, all that, um, those kind of acronyms um, you know, being prohibited to be registered in, in, in new TLDs. So I can just need a little reminder in the GAC's view that, that it continues to be their advice that they need to keep that moratorium in place. And finally, um, so what does all this mean in terms of the timing of round two? Um, you know, there's there's still so much that needs to happen before round two will get off the ground. I know there are people who want this to happen quicker. Um, mostly the consultants out there. There are some brands though. Uh, we we get calls all the time. People interested in this. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to get done before we move to round two. But um, you know, I can't still kind of starting on formulating like their um, ODPs to get the ball rolling towards the second round. 
you know, they kind of put out there during this meeting that, you know, maybe we could be ready by the end of 2022, early 2023. Got everybody all excited. I I hate to be a naysayer. Um, I just don't see that happening. So we'll see. Um, that's on the table. We'll, we'll see how it turns out. But um, I think that rounds it out for today. So, Tarek, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thanks, Gretchen. That was a great presentation. And that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you to everyone who joined us today, and we hope to see you next time.